Hill Church family. We are so glad that you are here with us. Remember to type in where you're watching from and make sure that you fill out prayers as we get into the service today. So we're going to start with a prayer. So will you join me in the opening prayer? We are entering the time of Advent. Advent reminds us that if God is to be born again in the most ordinary parts of our world and our lives, that we need to prepare for it. We need to make the space in our lives where love might be born. Welcome to this tiny corner of a harsh and dark world. Together, let us practice being ready in the faith that Christ will come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so at home, you know, you can stand up and sing. That's not a bad thing. And you can clap your hands. Remember we talked about that? So let's go ahead and we're going to sing. For you, Bethlehem, though you are the least significant of Judah's forces, one who is to be a ruler in Israel on my behalf will come out from you. Through the ages, God's people have longed for a righteous ruler who will speed the day when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We light the first advent candle as hopeful citizens of God's kingdom, awaiting the arrival of the anointed one, Jesus, you are king. Let us pray. God most high, who rules over all, you claim and call us all, despite our differences and disagreements, to be your son's followers. May your spirit so fill our minds and hearts as we worship you, that we come to understand and embody what it means to welcome Jesus the Messiah, to praise him and to follow him as the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace. Amen.
Hey kids out there, how are you? Did you know it is the first Sunday of Advent? And Advent, if we remember, is the four Sundays prior to Christmas Eve. Okay, so Advent means coming and preparation, waiting for Jesus. And so we're waiting for Jesus to come into our hearts in a special way this Christmas, but we're also waiting for Jesus' second Advent, which is returned back to earth. His first Advent was his birth. So Advent is a wonderful time of year. So next week, don't forget, we're going to have Christmas activity bags for you guys to pick up. And inside those bags are going to be little Advent calendars. And each day you can do something amazing, some kind of random act of kindness all for all the next four weeks. So isn't that exciting? So pick up your activity bags here at the church and we're going to have them Tuesday mornings, Wednesday morning, 9 to noon, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock next week. So that's exciting. But we're going to finish our vacation Bible school. And so I've got a short little children's message for you about the lesson that will be on our KingsleyMethodistChurch.com website for you to do tomorrow. So we are going to learn something amazing about Jesus' power. Because remember, we were talking about Jesus' power all week long. Well, this time, the Bible point is, Jesus' power helps us be good friends. Trust, Trust Jesus. Jesus. Oh, the praise team is on. All right, good job. So um, what makes a good friend? Is it someone who supports you? I would say that would make a good friend, wouldn't you? What else makes a good friend? Hmm, let me think about it. Somebody that plays with you, right? They don't leave you out of the crowd, right? They ask you to join in and to play with you. What are some other things that make a good friend? Maybe what makes a good friend is they make good decisions, right? Sometimes friends can make bad decisions. You know, sometimes we have friends that... Um, sometimes they're good friends for a while and then all of a sudden they just make a bad decision and they don't want to be your friend anymore. And so there's all kinds of things that go on, but let me use this experiment. Let's say this it represents you or me, right? Okay. And do you have a best friend? Do you have a bestie? Do you have a BFF? How many of you have a best friend? Okay. Raise your hand if you got a best friend. Okay. Raise a hand if you got a best friend out there. Okay. So best friends are amazing. I hope you have a best friend. And uh, they are few and far between. But a best friend is amazing. And then you can have other friends that join in and you become all kinds of really good friends, right? So let's say these tubes represent all the friends that I have. So let's say I get some friends when I'm in grade school, right? Oh, I get all kinds of friends when I'm in grade school. But then all of a sudden I go to middle school and this one friend doesn't want to be in the friend group anymore. Yikes. And then I get to high school, and then all of a sudden, my best friend right here, that I thought was my best friend, ditches me for her boyfriend, never to be seen from again. So, <laughs> I mean, I see her, but she doesn't see me. So I want you to know that sometimes friends are friends for a season, and it's okay. It's okay because we could get to college and have different friends, and it's okay. All we have to do is remember the great friends and the wonderful memories we had from, with them, even if we aren't close to them anymore. But I want to tell you something even more amazing. If you're out there right now and you don't think you have a good friend, I want you to know that you always have a friend in Jesus. So this stick represents Jesus, okay? And so being friends with Jesus is an amazing thing because being friends with Jesus means that we are stronger together. See? See how strong I am with Jesus as my good friend? We stick together like glue. Jesus doesn't leave you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus your Lord. So if you don't think you have a friend, you always have a friend in Jesus. And he'll stick to you like glue when you believe in him by faith. Because Jesus' power helps us to be good friends. Trust Jesus. So that's what you're going to learn today about being friends with Jesus and what that means. So I'm going to say a prayer for you. Well, actually, you're going to learn it tomorrow because I think it's going to be up on our screen tomorrow. So let's pray um, a prayer for all you kiddos out there. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for each of the lessons we have heard through the study on the Rocky Railway. We, we, have, been, we have learned that your power can do tough things, but we can, ha we can have hope and we can be bold. And we can live forever and we can have good friends. Jesus, help us to take these lessons with us so others will look to us as examples. And we'll want to be our friend as well, where we can tell them about our best friend, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, kiddos. So be looking for that video here tomorrow and enjoy that last lesson on the Rocky Railway. 
Okay, so we're going to go ahead and read some scripture. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Philippians, and it is, he's going to put on the screen verses 6 through 8, and I'm going to read 5 through 8. <laughs> so the verse 5 is, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Do you guys remember this picture up here Bud's going to put up on the screen? Maybe not, but let me tell you about this. Do you remember this button right here? <laughs> Do you remember this? That's right, listen. That was easy. <laughs> it's the easy button. Do you remember the easy button? Do you remember Staples? I'm going to tell you a little history about this uh, marketing campaign. You know, they started in 1986, I think, in Massachusetts, and they became a huge office supply store. Well, in about 2001, their sales tanked because everybody became an office supply store. Kmart did, and Meyer did, and Target did. So their sales started plummeting. So the VP of marketing said, we need a new marketing strategy. So what they did is they did focus groups. And what they found out is that their customers really wanted a straightforward, simple that was easy. shopping experience. <laughs> They wanted an easy shopping experience. They wanted knowledgeable sales staff and helpful, hassle-free, helpful sales staff and hassle-free hassle shopping. So that was easy. This marketing campaign hit the stores in 2005, and sales skyrocketed. It was an amazing thing. And then they sold these little buttons all over, I think, all over the country. So everybody has or have had at one time the... I don't know why there's a delay. It's really, I'm <laughs> really messing my timing up up here. It wasn't that easy. It wasn't that easy. That's right. So they made these buttons and they sold them, but it was kind of a lighthearted way to go ahead and hit the button just to try to make things easy in life. So when the voiceover on the commercials came in, it would say, wouldn't it be nice if there was an easy button for life? Now there's one for your business, Staples. That was easy. See? <laughs> and you're like, what is the point of this? Well, to me, I really wish there was an easy button in life. Don't you wish there was an easy button in life? I mean, when that annoying boss comes at you again, don't you wish you could just push this easy button and you would just instantly agree with them and everything would be smooth sailing? Don't you wish there was an easy button for life when you look and you see piles and piles of laundry and you have people coming over for Thanksgiving? Don't you wish you could just go that was easy. and the laundry's all done? Seriously, I wish there was an easy button for life. If there was an easy button for life, wouldn't you push it if you knew it could take the cancer away? If there was an easy button for life, wouldn't it be amazing if you could get back that loved one that you lost so that they could be back with you again? Wouldn't it just be amazing to have an easy button, an easy button for life? But then it really wouldn't be an easy button then. It would be a God button, wouldn't it? If we had a button that could do everything and make our life wonderful and joyful, we would have a God button. I want you to know that Jesus Christ had a God button. He had a God button. When he came to earth as a human being, God with flesh on, at any time he could have pushed the God button when things got hard. He could have pushed the God button when he was hanging on the cross. But he didn't. Do you know why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his son, and his son made a choice to follow through on his mission. So what we're going to talk about today is the incarnation. Many pastors don't talk about the incarnation much, but it is important to our Christian faith as the resurrection. In fact, I think the incarnation is even more important to our Christian faith than the resurrection because if God didn't become a human being, then there would be no death of Jesus, and without the death of Jesus, there could be no resurrection. So I think the incarnation is even more important to the Christian faith than the resurrection. And we know how important the resurrection is. God became 100% human and was still 100% God. Isn't that amazing? So for the next four weeks, we're going to start this new sermon series based on Adam Hamilton's book, Incarnation. And we're not going to talk too much about how the incarnation happened. How did God still be 100% God and then somehow he morphed into 100% human and how did that all happen? You know, we have to believe by faith that in the incarnation there was both mystery and miracle. 
Instead, we're going to talk about why the incarnation. So we're going to try to answer a few questions. We're going to try to answer a few questions um, about why the um, in, incarnation of God. Why would God come to us in Jesus? What was the purpose of the incarnation? How are we meant to respond to the incarnation, to Jesus' coming to earth? Adam Hamilton writes in his book, Incarnation, he says, My hope in this book is that we will rediscover the significance of Christmas because Christmas is a celebration of the incarnation. So we're going to talk about the incarnation for the next four weeks. Today I'm going to talk about the incarnation and what it means to us. And then we're going to move on to the names of Jesus that which he was given, the titles of Jesus, um, from the prophets and Mary and Joseph and all the different characters of Christmas. And we're going to see what those names mean as to what was the purpose for those names given to Jesus and what was the purpose of the incarnation. So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks. But today we're going to talk about what the word incarnation actually means. It's a Latin word and it means embodiment or to become flesh. But here's what I think is the most wonderful definition of incarnation. It refers to choices and action taken by our God in order to become human. That's what I believe in my heart that the incarnation is all about. It's actions and choices by God to become human. God took on flesh. He became fully human without ceasing to be fully divine. Now we're going to go back into a little bit of church history. Sorry, but if you're a history buff, you're going to be wide awake. If you're not a history buff, you might get a little snoozy. But that's okay because I think it's important to talk about the incarnation because we don't do it enough. And isn't that why we celebrate Christmas? Isn't the reason we celebrate Christmas because God came to us in the flesh? Isn't that why we celebrate Jesus coming to earth? This is God of the universe who put on skin. It's just an amazing thing to me. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the misinterpretation of Jesus, the person, and his mission. This has been going on for centuries. Um, even during the time of the Roman Empire, Constantine I, just have you know, there was much division and debate about the deity of Jesus. Because of this division, in AD 325, Constantine called the Council of Nicaea. So the Council of Nicaea brought together about 320 bishops from all over because they couldn't come to a consensus about the incarnation and the deity of Jesus Christ. So they called, so Constantine called this council together of all these bishops and kind of locked them in a room until they came to some kind of an agreement because there was a lot of heresies, some false teachings about Jesus. And some of them included, did Jesus have a human body but still have the mind and spirit of God? Another false teaching was, were there two Jesuses, a human Jesus and a divine person? So a human person and a divine person? And did Jesus and God meet somewhere and create a third nature? So there was all this different talk and, and heresies, they called them, from heretics. And there's all kinds of different names of these heretics that were inside the church. Arius is one. And I'll have you know that there are still what we call churches today that do not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. They put him on a different level as opposed to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. And you'll recognize some of those churches, the Latter-day Saints, which are the Mormons, and also the Jehovah Witnesses. So they followed in that Arius her 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 um, heresy that was from 325 A.D. Isn't that amazing that they've been fighting about the deity of Jesus for that long? So... Um, I think that that's kind of interesting stuff, don't you? <laughs> so, in this meeting in um, Nicaea, established the equality of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Holy Trinity, and asserted that only the Son became incarnate in Jesus Christ. So the other her uh, heresies were kind of laid along that side, and if the leaders still believed in that stuff, they were kicked out of the church. Now that sounds mean, doesn't it? But you can't have false teaching inside the Christian church. It just cannot happen. And so there's so many lies about Constantine. I heard one person say, well, Constantine wrote the Bible. No, he didn't. He called together all these bishops, and they went through and canonized the Bible. And then the very, this was the very first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, was the very first one, which is modern-day Turkey, by the way, that came together to strengthen the Holy Trinity of God, that teaching, that doctrine that Jesus Christ is deity. Jesus Christ is God, 
and he came to earth as flesh. So the other thing that came out of this council was that they um, wrote the Nissan Creed, or the Nicene Creed. And you'll be familiar with it because in the United Methodist Hymnal, hymnal in 880, page 880, is the Nicene Creed. Now here in the Methodist Church in Kingsley, we've talked about the Apostles' Creed a lot. We've even quoted the Apostles' Creed. But listen to this creed that came out of all these discussions and finally the consensus of the triune God. We believe in the one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal, begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to be judged by the living, to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. The Nicene Creed is in here. It is how many years old? 325 A.D. Isn't that an amazing thing? Do you know what you have in some of these hymnals? You have history here. And why is this so important? Why is the incarnation so important? Because we need to understand that Jesus was 100% God and 100% human. There was not part of God and part of Jesus, 80% God and 20% human, or 80% human and 20% God. It was 100% and 100%. How did that happen? I have no idea. I have no idea. But you know what? For God, it wasn't hard. That was easy. It was easy. It was easy for God to do that. And But it's hard for us to get our minds behind. So the incarnation is just an amazing, beautiful gift of God that we celebrate at Christmas. And we need to know more about it. The incarnation is all about a God who acts, a son who chooses, and humanity that is forever changed. So let's talk about those three things. So let's start by talking about how in the incarnation God acts. Paul writes, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. So how did God act in the incarnation? Well, in order for God to become human, he was going to have to take on certain limitations, right? He was going to have to take on certain things as a human being, and that means he had to set aside some of his God stuff. Okay, so he set aside some of his divine privileges. I like to call them the three omnis. Omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotent. He had to set those aside, and I'll tell you why. Number one, he set aside his omnipresence. God is omnipresent, which means he has the ability to be everywhere all the time. Now, you moms, you think you're everywhere all the time. You can be in, I think your children think you can be in three places at once, don't you? It's like, mom, I need cupcakes. Mom, I need the laundry done. Mom, I need this. And they want you to be in the... We can't do that as human beings, but God can. God can be in two or three or four or five places. He's omnipresent. But taking on flesh in the incarnation, he had to set aside that omnipresence to make room for humanity's limitation of time and space. We're limited to time and space. God is not. But if he wanted to be 100% human, he had to set aside that omnipresence. So you get that? You get it? Okay, the second thing is, God acted in the incarnation, and he set aside his omniscience. Now, omniscience means that God is all-knowing. God knows all things. You would agree, right? God knows your prayers before they even come out of your mouth. God knows your heart. He knows what you're thinking. He knows everything. But to take on humanity, to become human, he had to set aside that all-knowing to make room for humanity's limited knowledge. Now, there are people out there that do think they know everything. You know those know-it-alls? So the next time you meet a know-it-all, you can tell them, you are not omniscient. <laughs> Only God is omniscient. You are not all-knowing. You might be a know-it-all, but you are not all-knowing. So when... When God came to earth, we don't know everything. So God had to set aside that divine privilege of omniscience. The other thing he set aside was the divine privilege of omnipotence. God is all-powerful. That's what omnipotent means. He's all-powerful. God is in control of all things, including evil. God has control over Satan. You say, well, evil's running rampant. Yeah, he's going to let it run rampant until you guys all turn back to God. That's the whole point. He tarries so that we'll all become 
become believers in Christ, right? That's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for the church to continue to spread the good news. And what a great time to do it during Advent, right? So he has control over everything. He has control over Satan. He has control over evil. He has control over everything. But by taking on flesh, he had to set aside his omnipotence, making room for humanity's lack of power and control. And folks, if we think we're in control, if 2020 hasn't taught us anything other than we are not omnipotent, we are not in control. We are in control of absolutely nothing. Maybe our own reactions, but that's about it. So in order for God to become human, and humans are not all powerful, he had to set that divine privilege aside. Do you see what he had to set aside to become human? So that's how God acted. Now let's talk about how the Son chose, how Jesus chose. What kind of choices did Jesus make? Paul states again, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to or grasp to, another translation says. Jesus didn't have to grasp and cling at his divinity because he's always been divine. Jesus has always been the divine son of God, even before he became Jesus, before he became human. So God acted by laying aside his divine rights. And guess what? Jesus chose not to use them. They were there. They were there all the time, but he chose not to push the God button. He chose not to push the God button. And do you know why he chose not to push the God button? Because he had to fill out and finish the mission. So I'll give you a couple of examples of opportunities where God could have pushed the God, or Jesus could have pushed the God button at any time. The first example, the first example that Jesus could have pushed the God button was in the hymn. Isn't there a hymn that says at any time Jesus could have called 10,000 angels to get him down from the cross? That's a hymn. I don't know the name of it, but it's a hymn, right? How about when the Holy Spirit, you notice it doesn't say Jesus the deity and 100% human went out into the desert to be tempted. No, it says the Holy Spirit led Jesus out to the de desert to be tempted by the devil. So it's 40 days, right? And remember, Jesus is 100% human, also 100% divine. So he's 100% human. It's been 40 days since he's eaten. I can't even fast for two days without starving. I'm starving, Ruth Ann. I'm starving, right? So Luke 4, 3, the devil says to him, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Um, I'm curious. Why didn't Satan just pop out a pizza and go like this right underneath Jesus' nose and said, here's some pizza, dude. You want some? Take it. Eat it. Eat it. Isn't that what he did with Adam and Eve? Eat the apple. Eat the apple. Eat the apple. He says, no, if you are the son of God, turn this bread into stone. What Satan wanted Jesus to do was to pick up that omnipotent gift, that gift of all power, and turn that stone into bread. He wanted him to push the God button. He wanted him to pick up that um, omni, omnipotent, there's too many omnis, omnipotent, that all-powerful button, and he wanted Jesus to press it. But Jesus wouldn't do it because if Jesus would have picked up that divine privilege that God laid aside, he would not have been living a truly human life and he would not have been 100% human. You cannot be 100% human and be all powerful at the same time. Jesus chose not to push this God button when he was tempted by the devil. Here's another example. Jesus tells his disciples in Mark 12, 32, he says, this is Jesus speaking, even the son of man, he's talking about himself, doesn't know the timing of the second coming when Jesus will return. How does Jesus not know when Jesus is gonna return? That doesn't make any sense, but the incarnate, 100% Jesus did not know, but he had access to the information. He had access to the information at any time. He could have picked up that omniscience right? That all knowing, and then he would have known when he was coming back. But he didn't. Because as soon as he picked up those God powers again, if he would have picked them up, he would not have been 100% human. And if he wasn't 100% human, he could not die. And he could not be raised again. Do you see how important it is that Jesus did not push the God button? Don't you just wish on the cross he would have called those 10,000 angels and had him slice Herod from stem to stern? Oh, that would have been a clue. That would have been great. A bloody massacre. Kill Herod. He didn't. He didn't because if he would have.
would have, he wouldn't have been able to die the death of a human being to be raised again on the third day. And that was his mission. That was the reason he came. Here's another example. The miracles performed by Jesus were done not through that whole all-powerful um, divine privilege that he set aside. It was done through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to perform the miracles. Remember, before he raised Lazarus from the dead, we say him, but we know it was him, work, the Spirit working through him. He prays to God, and he says, Father, I know that you hear my prayer, but I'm praying this to you so that the people will believe that you sent me. You sent me, and in and through your power will raise Lazarus from the dead. He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. He did not push the God button to raise Lazarus from the dead. Because if he would have, he would have had to give up his mission. And he wasn't going to do that because his job was to save the world. So let's talk about how in the incarnation, humanity was changed forever. Paul writes, when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a cr criminal's death on the cross. Because God acted by setting aside his divine privileges and the son chose not to push the God button. That means one thing, he was able to come down to earth and become a human being. And it says he took on the form of a slave, the lowest position of God, the creator. The lowest position is humanity. He became one of us. And what does that mean? That means that all human beings are of sacred worth. Not one person is not worthy to be saved. Jesus came to save all. And that is why I'm a Wesleyan, because I believe in full atonement for all people, not just a few. Jesus would not have died for a few. He did too much. He set aside too much to become a human being. He set aside his ability to say, I am so sick of you, Herod. I'm done with you. Or the guy whipping him on the back. He could have hit that button at any time, and he didn't. He didn't. He became a slave. He took on the humble position of a human being. And you know what that means for you watching this? Is that if you feel unworthy, you are not. Because Jesus became human for you and for me. So that he could live a life and he would die a death so that he could be raised again and offer the gift of eternal life. The incarnation changed humanity forever because the other thing is that we have the same access to what Jesus used on earth in his ministry. What did Jesus use to get his ministry done? To feed the 5,000. He used the power of the Holy Spirit, right? He used the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't pick up his all-power button. He didn't push his God button. He didn't pick up that omnipotent button because if he would have, he would not have been 100% God. So he relied on the Holy Spirit. And he also, what did he rely on when Satan tried to tempt him? The word of God. Folks, we have the same thing. Incarnate living in us through faith in Jesus, we have the word of God. Doesn't God didn't the prophet say that God was going to put the word of God and write it on our hearts? We have the word of God in our hearts and we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So the incarnation changed humanity forever, offered us salvation. But more than that, offered us a way to not fall into temptation, to live a life that's hard, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do amazing things. The incarnation changed humanity forever. It's an amazing gift from God that we celebrate at Christmas. So let's not just talk about being resurrection people. Let's talk about being people of the incarnation. God who acted, Jesus who chose not to push the God button. And I am so thankful that he chose not to pick up his divine rights and that he went all the way through with God's plan and followed the will of the Father. Because the incarnation is a gift for you and it's a gift for me and it's a gift for all people. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for um, learning about the incarnation again. I know we know it, but do we really know it? Do we know the significance of it? That you, you acted and Jesus chose. And what is amazing to me is that we will never be the same. You did anything you could. You were willing to do anything you could to save your creation. And for that, we give you thanks especially in the
in this first Sunday in Advent. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So that's our first sermon on incarnation, Adam Hamilton's book. Next week we're going to start getting into the names of Jesus. And we're going to talk about the uh, kingly names. We're going to talk about uh, Messiah. And we're going to talk about how Jesus is king. Um, but right now we're going to go ahead and remind you that it's time for prayers. So what I want you to do is to type in your prayers. Remember, if you have authorization to type the person's name, type their prayer down. And um, if for health or surgery or whatever it is, don't go into too much detail. And we'll go ahead and put that on our prayer chain. We have somebody taking a look at those um, on Monday morning. So um, we're going to go ahead and say a generic prayer, and then we'll follow with the Lord's Prayer, and you can say that as well, and you can look on the screen. Lord, we do thank you for bringing us together to pray, to remember that you came in human form, and at any time, you could have said, done, done. I'm going to pick up the God card again, but you didn't. You didn't because you had a mission, and you followed the will of the Father, and I so thank you for it. And I thank you for all of those that know you by faith. And for those that don't, Lord, I pray that they will learn more about the incarnation and just this amazing gift at Christmas. Lord, we pray for those that are um, coming together and some may be traveling from different places for um, this Christmas season. So we just ask for safety as they come and go. And Lord, may they have a wonderful time over these holidays to spend with their family. We pray for those that are ill, Lord. There are many. There are many that are on hospice. We pray for them. And in their last days, Lord, we pray that they'll be able to spend time with their family somehow. Pray for those that are in nursing homes that can only get a wave through a window from their families. Lord, we thank you for the caregivers that work with them and for all our nurses and our doctors. We ask that you keep them safe. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your son. Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so again, make sure you write down those prayers so that we can check them out on Monday and we can make sure to get that on our prayer chain. Now this is the time that we do our offering. So I just wanted to remind you, um, to you can mail your offerings to the church at Kingsley United Methodist Church, P.O. Box 395, Kingsley, Michigan, 49649. Or you can even pay by PayPal at kingsleymethodistchurch.com and it will list ties and offerings. Just click on it. It goes right to our PayPal button. You can go ahead and do it that way as well. So either way, we really do appreciate it because we're going to continue to do ministry. So let's pray over our offering that we will get. God and gracious God, good and gracious God, we give you thanks for gifts of life, for gifts of love and joy during this season. For gifts of comfort when we do not or cannot feel that joy. For gifts of healing and mercy. For gifts of patience and serenity. For gifts of hope as we prepare our hearts for Christmas. May your spirit stir within us and may you bless and multiply these gifts for your good purpose. Amen. All right, we're going to close it out with a song. So get ready to sing and praise God.
9 to noon right here at the church on the corner of Spring and Blair. 9 to noon, pick up your uh, church activity bags. we got all kinds of cool stuff in there. And also Wednesday, 7 to 8, if you can't make it during the day. So let's say a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for reminding us the gift of the incarnation. What an amazing gift it is. And so as we celebrate Christmas, let us not forget that you gave up a lot. You gave up a lot to become human. We can't understand it in our mind, but we are so thankful that you did. And we have the same power as Jesus in us to live the our incarnation out for the world to see. So help us to do that this week and next week and for the weeks to come. In the name of Christ, amen. Have a good day. Amen.